Tell me your intro and. Uh, Okay, Jean, I think after Craig gets done, I'll have you take that other torture lamp downstairs. And I hope he does it right the first time because I don't like retakes. We will not goof up on this, okay? Well, let's let's not, not talk over each other. Don't giggle now, please. And don't talk over me. And don't laugh so hard and don't you take your all the, Don't take all the conversation. <laughs> I yes. will not. Be you do. Fun. You cue us if you okay. will, Craig. Uh, Can you do that? So I we will. don't both talk. <clears throat> I have a, he and I both talk over each other. Because mm -hmm. he never breathes, and I think he's done. And when he does breathe, then I interrupt him. <laughs> okay. Right. You okay. Point to either one of us, whichever right. way you want to go. Okay. All and right? if it's this, I mean, hurry up. Right Left now. is mom. <laughs> right <laughs> is me. Okay. Okay. Um, well, I want to just hear about your getting kind of a capsulized picture of where you were born, who your parents were, kind of where they came from, where you were born, and go into your early years up to the point you met. Okay. Would you like to know who we are? I want to know first who you are. Okay. okay. And who goes and first? Your age first. Go ahead. Oh, my age now? Yeah. Or when I was born? <laughs> Tell me anything Okay, about I was born January 14th in 1931, so that puts me right at 71 right now, 2001. I'm fortunate to have lived so long. <laughs> Anyhow. Go ahead, she's getting the giggles. <laughs> I knew this would happen. <laughs> but this is natural. Yeah, this is all right. Well, let's see. My parents both are from the South. <laughs> I can't do this. You can do it. Yes, you can. It, don't, it doesn't matter. You did fine over there. It doesn't have to be. It's your son over there. Just well, I already told him this, so it's kind of like a rehearsal. So but it is not that. Natural. Okay, well, my mother's from Southern Illinois, and my dad is from Southern Missouri, and they both ended up in a little town called Bartonville, Illinois. A family named Barton started the little town, and at the same little town was a Keystone Steel and Wire Company, which my dad came to to make the big money. That was the big thing in the steel mills and the big money. Well, uh, they had uh, me, and I was named Bernice Zora Clug, <laughs> but I was Granaman first. And it <laughs> <laughs> That's hard to remember, isn't it? <laughs> Who was the first born out of your family? Well, my mother was married before, and so my half-brother was Elmer, and uh, then my sister was born when they got married, and her name was Constance, and then came me, then there was a, a sister that was lost, uh, her name was Loretta, and then they had James, my brother Jim, he's still around, and I have a sister Sally, and she's in a home. So, um, anyhow. Now, Loretta, I don't know about Loretta. Well. Was she born? That was, a, it's kind of a long story. She was uh, quite a bit between me and her. I was like the youngest for a long time. And they, I was so excited. I was in grade school, and mother was going to have this little baby, and I couldn't wait for the baby to come. And one day, we had visited her aunt, her cousin in Peoria, and they had a big police dog, because her, her cousin's husband was a Peoria chief of police, and they always had this scary dog. But we were, they always went downstairs in the summer, and we were on the steps going down, and mother fell because she was afraid of their dog, he barked at her, and she lost the baby. Not at the moment, but she had a stillbirth. And so that was so disappointing to me because I was really looking forward to this baby. And I was in grade school, and my brother came to me one day and says, don't go home after school. And I said, why? He said, just don't go home. I said, well, why not? <clears throat> and he said, well, there's been a problem with the baby, and, and they don't want you to come home. So I had to wait around, and that was sad. So anyway, that was that part of it. My dad built us a new home, and we moved up to a brand new home. So that was pretty exciting. And Tell me, go back to your dad. Tell me about his his adoption and so that. Oh boy. Well, <clears throat> my dad was. Um, he didn't know he was adopted until he was 19. He was. Uh, uh, they told him, and. Uh, so then he did some research, and he, when he was three, he was in an orphanage because 
the woman that had him, uh, he never did know his real name until he got grown up and got a lawyer. And he found out he was born in a St. Louis hospital, and his real name was Emil Rector. And he always worried. He, he always wondered about that. He never got over it. He always wondered who, if, if he had other family. And, uh, how did you know how he spelled his name? Emil Rector. No, I think we wrote it down, but we haven't done anything to look it up. And uh, so he was adopted by a couple of uh, a couple named Graneman. They were German people. And I think they lived in McKittrick, Missouri. And they adopted him because the wife had just lost their baby and the doctor said for her to get over the shock and the whole thing they should adopt. And so they took him home and she couldn't handle a crying baby. She just wasn't capable of doing it. But then the brother of the man came along and raised him. He said, I'll take him out the farm and raise him. So they kept him in the family, but he was raised by the brother and his wife. And he had some sisters. and half-sisters, and when he started growing up, one of the sisters somehow had a baby, and he was lied to. He was told it was a sister, and he had gone away for a year. They sent him someplace while this baby was being born. When he came back, he found out that he was picking on her all the time, and they got on him about this is you know, you're not part of the family, you're adopted, and they laid into him, and he was in shock over it. It just really shocked him, and uh, he never did get over it. It's hard to tell somebody like that. How did he end up in Barnville? He went from job to job. He finally left the farm and went to work for some people, and he met some people named Stricklemeyer in a farm in Illinois, and then he went to um, University of Illinois down in Champaign to take a farm course and he met some people that told him about the steel mill and he came up here and he met what was funny, he got this fancy car and he wore these beautiful clothes and he ran around with two guys named George and Russell Strantz and they like the gals and well this one guy had a girlfriend and he says come on I'll introduce you to some of these uh, nurses aides up at the state hospital. So that's how my dad met my mom. He, he, they went up there and my dad lied to my mom. He said his name was El, uh, Jimmy Morgan. <laughs> so when he started liking her, he, he had to fess up that his name was Elmer Graneman. And her first husband was named Elmer and she didn't like that. So she always called him the name he lied to her about. And she, so she always called him Jimmy. <laughs> That's what you get for lying. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, it, what was funny then when we met later, uh, there was a story about that too because his mother used to have a, and mom and had a boarding house. My grandmother. Your, your mother's mother had a boarding house. And we got to mentioning he was dating Bernice Graneman. And she says, I wonder if that's Elmer Graneman. And it turned out it was. She knew my dad uh, before we even married. <laughs> and my dad was very private. He wouldn't let her clean his room. He wanted um, to do everything himself because he didn't think trust anybody. He didn't want anybody looking through he his probably things. Probably has money hidden in the little money. Uh, probably. I always said there were cans, <laughs> coffee cans full of money in the farm. <laughs> but now let Jean talk a while. I think unless you have something else for me. Um, we'll, we'll come back. We'll come back. So let, let's talk about your <coughs> your origins and how you ended up in Peoria. Well, just a little continuum of that story there. Uh, as it turned out, uh, Elmer, her dad and uh, my uncle, my mother's two brothers, George and Russell, worked all together in the galvanizing department at Keystone. They were side-by-side -side buddies in work as well as out with, with the girls, and I guess they had a good time at it. Well, as I think you know, my name is Jean. I was born uh, in uh, 1928, August the 30th, on Marquette Street in our home uh, on the south end of Peoria, Illinois. Uh, my mother gave birth to me at a tremendous weight of 12 pounds, unheard of. But uh, she survived, and I did too. The doctor delivering was uh, W.E. Cobble. And at the time he said, uh, if you'll name your son after me, and just using my initials, 
WEC, I'll buy him the finest suit of clothes that money can buy when he's 18 years old. And so they named me Willis Eugene Clauden, WEC. And I've never really answered to the name Willis all those all the years, although some people do. I know who knows me and who don't by that by virtue of that, mostly joined by Gene. But the old dude uh, was younger than his years. He was in his 70s when I was born. And by the time I reached 18, he had disappeared out of Peoria. He left Peoria, ran away with his nurse to Florida. I never did get my suit. <laughs> so it was a bad, a bad deal all the way around. And he still doesn't like his name. <laughs> <laughs> but in spite of the fact that I weighed 12 pounds, four years later, uh, my mom and dad uh, had another one, which was my brother Jim, named Alfred James after my dad, Alfred Benjamin. And uh, he uh, lived to be 49 years old, died of a heart attack unexpectedly. A tremendous. Uh, <laughs> Just a great guy. <laughs> In our uh, I think Dad forgot to tell you he was born in 1928. I did. Yeah. Did you tell me? Yeah. Uh, but uh, in, a, in a way, in the younger years, Jim and I didn't do much together because Russ came four years after him, and he and Russ in those younger years were far enough behind me that I had my friends in uh, later years uh, schooling and high school, and they had themselves. Uh, but in, uh, the, by the time Jim got into high school, uh, he and I would play church league uh, ball together. Uh, either he would catch or, uh, a pitch or I would catch a pitch, and we had a grand time doing it. We played basketball church league together, and also industrial league at uh, Mearson Label, who uh, hired him as well as me for a while. Uh, and uh, matter of fact, he ended up getting a very good job with, uh, with Mearson later moving to South Carolina after he got married with uh, uh, his wife, Jean, out of Greenville. Uh, my brother Russell, eight years younger than me, was named after my mother's youngest brother, Russell, and he's still alive, uh, and we uh, get together occasionally. He's a great guy. We have uh, a lot of fun razzing each other unmercifully, and somehow we get along without killing each other, but uh, we, we enjoy our company a great deal. Uh, how did your parents meet? Let's go back up a little bit. Well, it's a, a strange in that regard because my dad was married once before, and his wife, uh, uh, with a caring child, was doing the dishes in her home one evening, and she dropped dead over the sink. At that time, no one knew why. They assumed it was a matter of complications with the, with the birth. Uh, my dad uh, came in contact with uh, my mother through, of all people, uh, the same people that her mother came in contact with uh, her, uh, her dad. And uh, they started dating at an early time. Shortly before that, however, she had lost uh, Excuse me. her... Uh, she was to, to be married to someone else. The fellow worked in the nail mill at Keystone as a millwright. And uh, his name was John. I don't know his last name. But fate uh, brought my mother and dad together in two regards. One, his wife died. And two, the man she was going to marry was killed in an uh, overhead belt drive in the nail mill at Keystone, just, just like that. And uh, they, they were married about within a year after his wife had passed away. And uh, that, for some reason or other, left a, a bad feeling in uh, sisters and brothers on my dad's side of the family. They felt it was too soon. Of course, the old-fashioned uh, thinking at that time was you had to wait a respectable whatever it might be, years, in fact, before you'd be married. But uh, thankfully, they got married when they did because uh, here, uh, here I am. And they were great parents. Do you want to pick up from, from there? Well, we could talk about where we worked in our lifetime. Well, I'd, I'd like to talk, well, I'd talk about that and talk about what it was like just growing up in those years, like in the 30s and the 40s. Oh, 
talk about your first job or your experiences at school. Or... Well, when I grew up, um, when I heard about World War II, I didn't know what a war was even about. And uh, next thing I know, I'm into my teens, and there was all the women had gone to work in the plants, all the men were gone. So when I was young, it, it was like that old song that goes, they're either too young or too old. Well, I was 13 and bored, and uh, uh, I guess that I was getting into my independence because at home, my home life was a little hard. Uh, we had Sally home for six years, and that was real hard because she was screaming a lot, and I just felt like I wanted to grow up, and uh, so I heard about this friend of mine in the same eighth grade grade school that had a job at Bishop's Cafeteria and I thought well if she can work up there I ought to be able to. So I wasn't 13 yet actually and I went up and I told him I was 16 at Bishop's Cafeteria and uh, I looked, I tried to look older and I got the job and then I wanted to work in the galley which was downstairs and they had all this great jukebox music and and it was just kind of more of a lifestyle I liked and I so I shifted to go down to that job downstairs and it was hard for me to work because I had to I was a mile from any bus line and I had to run down and get a bus go uptown do my job go to the bus depot go all the way back to Bartonville and I if I missed a 1030 bus there wasn't another one that went up to my home until 1230. So a lot of times I get up, if I miss the 10:30 bus, I'd run a mile to go home in the dark, and that was pretty scary. But anyway, I did get the job in the galley, and um, another girl came from Bartonville to start working. Well, she had quit her babysitting job to do this, and we got squealed on that we didn't have workers permits, and you had to have a workers permit if you were 13 to work. Well, I wasn't even 13, so I quit that job and went to Walgreens, got a 10 cent raise and told them I was 16. <laughs> <laughs> so then after that, I, these jobs were like in between school. I worked at uh, Kresge's and I promoted their record department to 120% because it was going downhill and, and uh, I got to be a buyer. Now mind you, I was like 15 or very young, 15, and uh, I thought it was so neat to be have my own department, get to go up to Klaus Radio, that little white dog they always use for their admiral uh, insignia, and I got to, I just sit there and they'd put all the new records on. I said no, 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 maybe. And then one came on called a, a To Each His Own, and I said, boy, will you play that again? And they played it over. I said, oh, I'll take 24 cases. Was that the one by <laughs> I had no hour? idea what I was doing. I just thought, that sounds like a good number. I, so I bought all these records. I took them. They brought, delivered them to Kresge's Dime Store. And I was the only place in town that had this record. And all these other stores were trying to buy them from me, and I was... Making raising the price. On, I was making Kresge so much money, so I got boyfriends, and then my one boyfriend, his father owned Byerly Music, so he talked me into coming there and work. Well, he was always gone to college, and I met Jean, and we ended up. I quit that job, and he was working as an artist out at Murison Label, so I went out there and got a job and tripled my salary by sorting labels, but we thought money at the time to get an early start in life was better and he didn't want me working there anyway with my old boyfriend. <laughs> and so then, uh, let's see, we worked there. I got pregnant with Camille. I worked seven months before I quit. And then uh, after that, let's see, I had Vicki about two years later. And then after that I got restless and I wanted a part-time job so I got to be a cashier out at the Peoria Drive-In Theater and uh, worked the one summer doing that. And uh, then I think that we got transferred into Tennessee and I was a church secretary there and became president of the Donaldson Greeting Club. I sort of came out of my shell. <laughs> I mean, I just d 
blossom because Jean traveled all the time and I knew I had to be strong for the kids and so I joined anything and everything I could and anything you volunteered come up with a suggestion all right away you're the committee chairman and I went from treasurer to president and we did that for several years and then we built a home over on Hendersonville on the lake and there's where I was the church secretary and the youth leader for children. And she, I have to interrupt you. She struck them so well with the, and the greeting club that they entered her into the Mrs. America <laughs> contest and she would have qualified for it but we didn't have gas in the home we were running at the time and it was sponsored by Nashville gas. <laughs> Plus, we so were she renting. got disqualified. Well, you, could, you had to own your own home too. You couldn't oh, be you renting. Okay. You couldn't be renting. <clears throat> she told me I had a good, good chance of winning because she liked me. The woman that interviewed me. But, and they all uh, called her Liz. <laughs> then after we, okay, I did that secretary work. Then we got Jane got transferred back to Keystone, and uh, when we got back here, I was getting over the Asian flu, and that took me a while. I was really weak. And I just knew we needed so much, and we we really lucked out buying the house in Peoria because uh, it reminded us of the one on the lake. We hated to leave it, but then opportunity knocks. Sometimes you don't know if you're taking the right step, but we got readjusted. But I inst I just had to go back to work, or I had to do something. I couldn't sit around, so I got a part-time job. My next-door neighbor was getting her home redesigned and uh, I was day before I was telling her how bored I was. I said the kids are all in school and I said I'm lonesome, I, we need everything and I said I just wish I could do something part time. Well she told her interior decorator who had his own shop and, and she, he said well I need a girl Friday uh, to do different things in the shop and uh, answer the phone and do all these things and I said well I, so he called me and I went interviewed. Hi, Camille's home. Back from her trip from Jack. We're being interviewed. Hi, right, baby. <laughs> well, then you continue not bring all my stuff in. Oh, okay. Okay, because I just. Okay, <coughs> I the door open. I wasn't sure if you guys were home, but I figured you were. Well, long story to make it short, I worked for him part time, but in the meantime, he was de making a deal to go downtown and replace this big time decorator in a big department store which I would never have gone there on my own to even try and get in because I was just kind of getting used to the idea of learning the, the field. Well I got there, I went went there as a part time, uh, oh I did everything but I ended up getting the secretary job for five decorators and I did everything. I mean I had so many job descriptions you can't imagine it but it was hard for me not to work full time I wanted only part time but they needed me so bad and I was afraid if I gave up my summer job that I'd get not get my keep my job and so in the meantime I was they were all the salespeople in the main part of the store were taking this interior decorating course and I asked if I could take it it was a home decorating course and you had to do all these test sheets and mail them back and send, you had five choices to make on your project. You had to send in a, week, a weekly project. So I did that and then they grade it and send you back. Well, I'm proud to say that I got an A minus. I missed two questions <laughs> or I might have had an A plus, but they, it was fun. I learned a lot and uh, I reread the course three to two more times after that because it recommended you read it three times. Well. I sort of have a photographic memory and after you read it three times you really remember all that and I was really grateful. So later I do, gave up that secretary job and became an interior decorator. So then I worked at that store a total of about 10 years and then I left there. The store had a fire and I didn't like the way things were going there and I quit. Then I went to Littman's because it was a higher scaled store and it wasn't all these elevators you have to take. It was a private store and everything was on one level and it just appealed to me to be closer to home. So I took that job. I worked there 18 years so I was working in that business for 28 years, retiring when I was 63 and I could have retired a year sooner but I wanted to make sure I got all my commission. 
believe me, straight commission for 28 years isn't lots of fun. You'll get burned out. And I thought, I have had it. <laughs> I've had it, I've had it. So I retired and I didn't, I miss people extremely. I thought we'd travel more, but that didn't work out real good. And uh, so then we started doing community Bible study and got inspired and through the study courses, um, I got Jean involved, and then we got into an art project where I would get all these visions from what I learned, and I'd make up stories out of the Bible of what my vision was, and I can't draw, so I got Jean to draw them, then I painted them with a technique I could, I can't paint with a brush, so I have a technique, I paint with a, a needle by using drip beans and slidings and, and things like that, so it's just Kind of like a piece of jewelry. <laughs> well, let's go back in time now to, to Dad, and maybe we can get up to the point where you meet. You can start talking about how you meet, how you met, okay. working in the merit. Uh, well, I'll give you a little uh, clue. I went to uh, my grade school through the seventh grade at Garfield Grade School in South Anna Peoria, and uh, from there to Roosevelt Junior High, which was the uh, eighth and ninth, and then to Manion, which at that time a high school was only a three year school, and graduated from there. In 1946, in uh, in, in the process of uh, the senior year at uh, Manual was where I would leave the physics class going to PE, and I would see this beautiful thing. <laughs> Coming down the hall, I didn't know who she was, <laughs> and uh, I had I didn't have the guts to ask her, but the uh, senior hop was coming up. And I asked my cousin, uh, Shirley, she lived in Barnwell, too. I said, who is this gal? And, you know, I wonder if she'd go to hop with me. So and Shirley said, well, why don't you ask for yourself? I said, well, kind of feel it out for me. So she did, and as it turned out, uh, we did go to the hop. I wanted to take her on another date before that just to get acquainted. And it was a hay rack, right? And she wouldn't go. She was afraid of me. <laughs> but she knew a little bit about me. and. Uh, so we we hit it off uh, not really well at the beginning, but uh, we learned to understand each other, and that's the way our 50 or three years of uh, Mary's life has gone. We we're, it's still a learning process. <laughs> but uh, what did you see in Dad back in those days? Was he, you saw him as an artist doing some things? Well, I was a sophomore, and uh, I, we always went to homeroom first thing, and. Uh, I was sitting there, and the Gebhardt gal behind me tapped me on the shoulders. Jean was had a picture on the big glass window up there, and this guy was on a ladder, and he was going up and down the ladder and doing stuff, and went out of the room, and he'd come back, climb that ladder, and, and I was watching him go up and down that ladder, and he looked pretty darn cute. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she tapped me on the shoulder. She says, "By the way, the picture was an oil." Uh, brown oiled paper of Jesus, and I thought, boy, this guy's Christian, you know, this nice guy, if he's going to paint a picture of Jesus, that really impressed me. And she tapped me on the shoulder, she said, you know who that is? I said, no. She said, that's Jean Claude, and, and uh, she said, all the girls around here would like to date him. I said, oh, they would, huh? Well, that's the last of it. I didn't see him until this episode he's talking about. Two years later. <laughs> yeah. Two years? No. Oh, it was about a year. Maybe a year, but I was a sophomore well, when you it asked been me a year out. Later. Yeah, yeah. You saw me then; you were a freshman, and I no, saw you when you were a no, sophomore. Manuel, I had sophomore, junior, uh -huh. senior. I was a senior. Oh, that's right. I, remember I, much about that first date? What? You remember much about the first date? Yeah. Everything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, Go. <laughs> uh, well, we double dated, and. Uh, I didn't want to go with him to that either, and this guy that we fixed his cousin up with said, well, if you don't want to go out with him, I'll go out with him. And I thought, well, if she thinks he's cute enough to go out with, I'll go out with him. <laughs> so sure. we went to, we, we got picked up, we went to the Pier Marquette, which is our nicest hotel in Peoria. We went to a very formal sit-down dinner down in the Peoria room, that was the cat's meow back then. And uh, we went upstairs to the Cotillion room. Yeah. The cotillion room had his top. And I had on this beautiful white formal with ostrich feathers. One side was strapless and it was this side that had the strap, but the ostrich feathers were one here and then 
scattered around here. Well, he bought me this beautiful wrist massage of red roses and little baby spread. So I looked beautiful. <laughs> he looked handsome. I couldn't hardly keep my eyes off. Well, what's dry. funny, this is what's really sad. We had a big fight on our first date. <laughs> we went upstairs after dinner, and I had taught so many of these guys how to jitterbug when we used to go to these teen dances. And I, they give you a card to hang on your wrist. Well, I'd never been to a hop. I'd never had a card on my wrist. I didn't found out you were supposed to sign up for the dances. And he didn't sign up for any of them. So I went to my friends, and I was, uh, it was so cute to get signed up for dances. I had never been signed up. And so I'm out there dancing away, and, and, and uh, this guy says, you know, when you go on a date, you're not supposed to dance with other guys. I said, you're not. <laughs> No, pretty soon I looked over and he had his top coat on and they were going to leave me. And I walked up to him, I says, where are you going? He says, we're leaving. I said, well, you can't leave me here. And he said, so I, I quickly left with him and then you can finish it. <laughs> well, it uh, was my cousin Don Stewart and a girl that he dated with. I introduced him to her at the Waikiki uptown, the YMCA had a place. And she went to Central, not Maine at all. And what's her name, Marty? Marty. Marty. Cute, yeah, a lot of fun. And uh, they hit it off real well, but it never went beyond that. But uh, anyway, I think I told you in an earlier shooting about the car incident with uh, spending all day polishing and waxing it that brought my aunt uncle 39 Ford. And uh, so I drove, picking her up and then picking them up. and. After the uh, after the dance, we got in the car and just decided we'd take a ride. And uh, it was a rainy night. We got someplace up in the heights off a of prospect, and I made a left-hand turn, which I thought was uh, through Street. It was Forest near Hill. Von Steuben yeah. School. And I, I missed it by a block or two. And all of a sudden, the little wipers on the windshield wouldn't take care of the heavy rain. Couldn't see where I'm going, and I'm out of the streetlight range, and all I can see are corn stalks going by the windows. <laughs> <laughs> and I put that old baby in low gear and made a U-turn using the beacon, which is nothing more than a street light to get fine back to civilization. Finally made the complete loop, tore up the cornfield terrible, I'm sure. Got back on the street and we continued our little drive around. Well, in the process of driving around, Don and Marty are in the back seat. Well, here I got this lovely thing in the front seat. I can't do a thing but drive, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going down Galena Road from Deadwater Park, mm -hmm. and it's quite late at night. And I uh, saw this driveway that looped up in front of a, what appeared to be a factory of some kind. And we pulled up in there and traded so Don and Marty got up in front and we got in the back seat. I kissed her. <laughs> <laughs> and guess where that was? The driveway of Muris and Label. Were we both I had no up? idea we'd ever be there again. But we both ended up there, as you all know. Yeah. And uh, anyway, that was quite an eventful night, but I, I, I'll share with you again a story that I dropped them all off, went back out to the farm at Minnunkiulis and parked the car and went to bed, got up the next morning and came downstairs and Uncle Uli sitting on the back step and kind of looked at me with that little grin and he says, uh, would you mind telling me where the hell you were last night? <laughs> I looked. The car was mud up as high as the handle, the door handles and corn stalks hanging up. From <laughs> he says, here I give a kid a car, he cleans it up and goes to town and brings back the corn field. <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. But that kicked things off and I wouldn't let her out of my sight after that because she was... When we were yeah, sensible, we dated and we were engaged uh, once, broke up once, and we got another ring and ended up, we were engaged a year and a half. And uh, the war, World War, World war II was over and the Korean War was starting About, and there was that in between where a lot of his buddies were going to take that National Guard or Well, we they had an option of either joining for two years or, or taking the draft. And uh, there was no war on and I thought, this is silly, why go into the military? I would have gone during the war but I, I was still in high school and the war was over with in uh, August of 45. We gradu I graduated in, in June of 46 
and then later on the uh, Korean thing popped up in the early 50s. So we had a period in there that it was, the draft was still active, and I thought, I'll just wait it out, they're going to draft me fine, but in the meantime, uh, it's pointless. To, well, they had to join for four years, or, or be drafted for two. Well, and I took my chances. Well, it came to the point where it got so close, he was going to have to go in one month. And uh, we had been engaged that long, and, and uh, he said, uh, will you write to me? And I said, why should I write to you when I can keep you? Because they're not taking married men. I said, we're, we know we're going to get married, so let's just get married a little sooner. I said, you either marry me now or never. And he married me. <laughs> in 48, it was strictly a peacetime army because the wars were all over with, and it was strictly a period of rehabilitation. And uh, I thought, well, so, okay, she wants me that bad, we... Well, we did it. here's what happened. We, so because of that, we were married. They were taken single men. When they were taken married men, we had Camille. When they were taken married men with one child, we had Vicky. So then it was all over. So we sort of lucked out. No deliberate plan to it. It just, just it was our life, and worked. we planned it. Uh, maybe God had a little bit to do with it, but I just thought, why go away? That seems so, you know, when, why give up something you got when you don't have to? If it's but a there good have been thing. times in our marriage when she's maybe been a little upset with me, and she would say, you should have been in the Army. <laughs> Your attitude, you fit the army. <laughs> Talk about some of your early jobs. Well, my, my early jobs were very early. Uh, when I stayed on the uh, farm in, in Glassford with that many young Kiyuli, as early as when I was eight or nine years old, and I was a water boy during the threshing run. And I did chores, uh, I actually worked out there on the farm. And in later uh, years, as I got a little older, they'd let me pitch bundles. Uh, from the wheat field on the wagon would go into the uh, thre uh, threshing machine or help put up hay, baled hay or loose hay, either one, and make the rounds of the 17 farms that was sort of a co-op. Uh, one guy had all the good big equipment and he did the custom work for each farm and all the other farmers would pitch in and help each other during the harvest time. It was a great time. I had wonderful food, wonderful people. And on Saturday nights it was always downtown Glassford on concrete blocks and two by twelve planks to see free movies and free Pepsi Cola, no less. <laughs> we always had uh, about three cartoons, a, a newsreel, and a double feature. And I'm telling you, the people came from miles around. The town just jumped. Little bitty bird, maybe a population of 125 or 130. And uh, at that early time when I stayed out there, they sold eggs and milk and butter that they would. Uh, from their, from their farm. The farmhouse sat right on the, the edge of town like it was part of living in town, and the farmland laid out east of town. So we had neighbors all around. And I remember one time I was in the, uh, uh, what was a separated house, bring milk in and separate the cream from it. It was also the bathhouse. We'd take a big bathtub of rainwater out there and let the sun warm it up, carry it into the uh, milk house and take a bath. Well. I was out there needing to rinse the soap out of my eyes. I washed my hair at the same time. You don't do that too smartly. And I couldn't find the towel. And I reached for the, the door of the place, and I thought I'd better run for the pump. Well, there was a big thicket of hedge between their house and the neighboring house, and I'm trying to make it to that pump to pump the fresh water to get the soap out of my eyes. I'm probably nine, ten years old at the time, and I slipped in the mud. and. I heard nothing but giggling over the fence, and to this day I don't know for sure, but there was a girl lived over there, and she had a friend from Pekin who always came out and stayed with her, uh, and I thought, the sure as hell saw me through that, and I was embarrassed. And I used to go by their house, going to town to pick up the mail and paper. It was about an eight-block uh, walk, and I, for, because of that, I'd go two blocks out of my way, so I wouldn't have to walk in front of their house. And on another uh, home, uh, a lady that uh, lost her husband at an early time lived all alone, sweet little lady, and she always got uh, a quart of milk and uh, uh, every day, and it was always fresh out of the out of the, out of the milking of that day, and I would take it as it would. Well, they had maybe ten people to deliver milk and eggs and butter to, 
and uh, I was delivering that. Well, they had their back porch, the screen, was painted with white paint. You couldn't see into it, and a lot of people did that purposely because it, you couldn't look through it in, in daylight. At nighttime, as like <coughs> any other screen you could. Well, here I am walking out there like I normally do, and I open up this screen door to take the milk in because I'm always told to put it in the ice box, which is on the porch. I walk in on this gal about 20 years old, standing up buck naked in a tub of water on the back porch, and boy, I got a revelation that day. <laughs> well, you never told and, me and that. She, she grabbed for the <laughs> towel and said, excuse me. And I said, excuse me. I turned my head, set the milk up on top of the of the ice box, and the Mrs. Oh, I can't remember her name. She <laughs> kidded me about that later on when she heard about it because this was her niece from some other town, and that was the only place that they could take a bath. On a, but I didn't know, and I told her I said the next time you ought to have a sign you hang on that screen door, bath in use. <laughs> you know? But uh, it was a lot of fun living out there in the summer times, and then later on I would plow cultivate corn and run machinery, uh, uh, drive a team, uh, hook up the teams, uh, ride the saddle horse, bring the cows up, milk them, feed the pigs, the whole bit. These were summer jobs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did that, in fact, well into our early marriage, just because I loved going out to help uh, cultivate or do whatever it was on the farm. But uh, my earliest job in town was at Brophy's, a little confectionery up on the corner, three doors from where we lived on Stanley. And I asked old John if he needed any help up there. I said, I could wash your windows. Well, it started out, he gave me a quarter for washing the windows. And they had a corner location, so there was two great big windows to wash. And it would take me a little while to do it. And at that time, you didn't have the sparkle stuff you got today. We used drift and squeegee, and it always came out fine. And later uh, he learned that uh, I, I was watching the guys who would come with their uh, different uh, products to sell and decorate the window to promote their products. And I learned how to use the crepe paper. So when they wouldn't be doing, I asked John if I could decorate the window by, I learned how to tack the paper down, string it up, and make decorum and so on. Well, at that time, there was no such thing as the, the as uh, openness about uh, uh, women's needs and uh, all of the boxes of sanitary napkins came in and huge boxes we had to take them and wrap them in brown paper and put them up on the shelf this is well, a real memory <laughs> they were they were attractive uh, boxes you know different colors for different sizes for different needs and i thought one day well those make a pretty good display in the window <laughs> created quite a stir to say the least. I didn't know about it. And so I'm decorating the window and John comes out, takes a look at it. He says, they don't look bad, but I don't know how the lady's going to like that. He says, they don't want to see their sanitary napkins on display like that. And I says, you can't be serious. And I'm 12 years old. Yeah, I don't know about those things. But I worked there. They had a soda fountain, jerk and sodas. And uh, I finally ended up a job with John. Ten bucks a week, and I figured out one time the number of hours I was working, I was actually making ten cents an hour some weeks. And I did that all the way through uh, uh, junior high school, and uh, then a friend of mine uh, got a job at Tri's Market across the street, and he was making thirty-five cents an hour, which I thought, boy, that's big money. And I went over and talked to uh, Hermie Cry and the manager of the bar, and they hired me. I told John, you know, I can't afford to stay here. I'm going across the street. So I worked in the grocery store. And in fact, one time, I uh, was given responsibility to buy produce for the produce department. Wilbur, uh, the manager, had to leave. He was about to have a nervous breakdown. He needed a job to get free of the responsibilities he had. And he ended up running a bread truck at the time. And so Hermie asked me if I'd do the buying on the produce. And the first thing I did was cut down on what was eventually loss going out to the uh, to the garbage because Wilbur would just buy too much and we only had ice and water to keep it uh, fresh and boy, in hot weather to kill you. But uh, I learned a lot doing that and uh, cutting meat and filling orders and making deliveries uh, at uh, the time I was 16. 
and uh, did that until, uh, well, between, uh, I'd, I'd always quit when I played ball because I had full-time commitment to ball in my sophomore, junior, and senior year in, in high school. And they knew that because I couldn't do both. So during the season of baseball, uh, I didn't work, but the rest of the time I did. Um, after graduation, which uh, was in 1946, I was given uh, two scholarships. One was a Russell Memorial, and another was a Bradley uh, University uh, Fine Arts Scholarship. And the two combined in monetary value was not a lot of money, but uh, it was uh, directing me to get into a program to become an art teacher. That's what Bradley had in mind. And uh, <clears throat> my whole goal in life at that time was to be an architect. And I went to them and asked if they wouldn't change their uh, uh, assignment of that uh, to uh, engineering, because Bradley didn't have an advanced school in architecture, but I could get preliminary through the, the math and the algebra, or the uh, engineering aspects of it at Bradley, and then maybe go to Illinois or Northwestern and finish up like that. But they wouldn't change it. And I couldn't, I wasn't smart enough, I guess, at that time, or, or patient enough to say, well, I'll work my way through and make up the difference and go on from there and do it on my own. Well, in fall, in the summer of that same year I graduated, Block and Cool had their central distribution in Peoria and seven major department stores throughout the state. And I went to work in their advertising department doing uh, wash drawings for the advertising and newspapers. And uh, I only did that for about three months. Carl Hiddle, who ran the advertising department, called me in one day and he said, uh, I'm thinking about uh, making you an offer to send you to Chicago. I'd like to make a fashion designer out of you. And I thought, that ain't my bag. You know, and Carl, he was a he was a nice fellow, mind you, but he struck me as being a little bit light in the feet, and uh, he sat there with his legs crossed in a swivel chair, and <laughs> at a man about 55 or so, I thought, I just can't see this happening. So I thanked him very much, and I said, no, I think I'll just look for something else, but in the meantime, I'm happy what I'm doing here. Well, I didn't have to wait long, but within about a week of that, uh, Freddie Cars, who was a former manualite that was in a management position at Mearson Label, uh, called for me and said I'd been recommended by the people at Manual that uh, contact to see if I would uh, like to work in their art department as a staff artist designing labels. So I went out and talked to uh, Freddie and uh, Harley McDaniels, who was a plant superintendent at the time, and they hired me. And I took the job because it paid twice what I was making, which was really not a hell of a lot of money. Uh, either way, but I took it. And uh, I worked for them for about uh, four and a half years, uh, designing, of all things, canned food labels, and did well at it. Uh, made good money. Uh, won awards. Won awards, uh, an outfit over in Indiana, the Regal Foods. I wanted to complete, change a complete uh, store chain image and I designed the logo for Regal Foods and the first time ever made a black label that was unheard of. And they loved it because it stood out. And I uh, had a lot of fun working with the salesman. I tried to get uh, Mearson to let me go from designing labels to going on the road and, and being a salesman because I could do both, you know. But uh, out of San Jose, California, the, hill, the home office, they wouldn't allow that because you had to have a minimum of two years of college in business administration to be a salesman. I thought, this is crazy. Well, I got a little restless and went up to Milwaukee. A fellow who was in the office at Mearson was going to run a plant up in Milwaukee for Myracord, uh, the world's largest printer of decals. They were going to start up a label division up there. but. It was going to be in the letterpress, which I won't get into that, but offset was the way things were going in the printing industry at the time. And that was a handicap Mearson had. They were all letterpress. They didn't have the flexibility that offset provided. But still, I got to thinking about it. Irv left. That he took three salesmen with him and a couple of other key people. There's some holes here to fill. I thought, this is a good place to stay. 
And we were married building, we built a house up on Eugenia Lane, and uh, I thought, hey, this was pretty good, you know, I think I'll stay here. We came back from Milwaukee on the weekend and uh, went to work on Monday, nothing was said. On Tuesday afternoon at 2 o'clock, Joe Eiler, who's the president of the company, called me in and fired me on the spot because I went up to uh, Milwaukee looking for a better job. And uh, some people had a few things to say to set that up that were a little bit jealous of some advancements that I had passing people and getting responsibilities that other people had had that they gave up because I could handle it better. Uh, not just in the art end of it, but in coordinating <coughs> art and sales. And uh, Joe found out about that later, many, several years later. In fact, I'd already gone with Keystone. But we were from, I think, about October of that year until, uh, no, no, I'm sorry, December of that year. Uh, until March, I didn't have a job, and uh, I'd applied for Keystone, and uh, pretty desperate, because we were, we were struggling. And uh, Ford Schuster called one afternoon, or evening, I should say, said, why don't you come in Monday? And I started March the 3rd, 1962, with Keystone. But there was a period in there, that four and a half year, a time with, uh, with Mearson, I left to take on a challenge with Dick Stubinger and Austin Marshall to run. Uh, we were the owners and operators of two good-sized stores in Peoria, one right downtown on Fulton Street, and it was uh, 12,000 square feet of uh, floor space on each floor, and we had two floors, and we sublet the sporting goods department to. Bill Mann and Squeaky Mel Troy, who were Bradley basketball stars, and everybody loved at the time. And uh, we thought that would help not only bring in people, but it also helped pay the rent that we agreed to with H.T. Morgan. That's okay, another so story. Toy Town Maximus. It was called Toy Town Maximus. H.T. Uh, Morgan, who was a retired uh, or an ousted uh, president of Block and Cool, was going to get even with him. And he had a lot of money. And he was going to build stores in every town the Block and Cool had a department store. And uh, his first operation in Peoria was going to be Toy Town Maximus, uh, totally involved in toys and hobbies and, and that kind of stuff. And uh, it was quite a, quite a deal, really. A beautiful store on Fulton Street, just a block away from uh, the railroad station. Well, they joined the name, of, so they called it the Holiday Store, so it would take in everything. Yeah, but uh, his family interceded after a, a tragedy, and that was another situation that really involved me in another job. Uh, his uh, business advisor, Sidney Nagel, lived up in the Heights. I talked to him about uh, tying into their uh, advertising or marketing in their main headquarters which is going to be in the building, which at one time was the old Ingleterra Ballroom in Peoria. But they were remodeling that totally to be a high fashion store, and then in the back and on the second level was going to be their corporate headquarters. That was a, a, a big deal, and strictly high fashion. And uh, we got along real well. I talked to uh, Nagel three times, and he finally called me back for another, which really would have been the final interview, because we talked money and went to his home up in the Heights and spent a couple hours kicking it around. Here I am just 21 or 22 years old, but for some reason he seemed to have a sell something in me that uh, he was willing to pay money for. And uh, so uh, I felt really good leaving there and I came home and uh, walked in the door and I told Mom, I said, hey, sounds pretty good, she's you better listen to this. And here they're broadcasting direct from the fire on Main Street. The damn place is burning down totally. That ended that mm -hmm. potential there. And the family interceded with H.T. Uh, uh, and made him divest all of these other uh, leases that he had set up and stop everything. They did let him keep Toy Town Maximus. But then he didn't want to settle just for that. And Chet Anderson, who was his attorney, was talking to us about, uh, talked to Dick about, would you 
and uh, Claudin and Marshall want to take a shot at this. And so we worked up a contract with them. We had an agreement for buying all the inventory. We had uh, terms on how we would retire that obligation to him and a monthly uh, rent uh, that we had to pay. And we opened up the holiday store. We reopened Toy Town Maximus as the holiday store. And that's when we brought Melchorian Man into it. But in uh, about June of that same year, uh, 1950, there was a basketball scandal where people were paying stars on key teams not to lose games, but to shade points to close the spread so that the guy doing the booking on gambling would not have to pay out. You know, people would bet for somebody to win by a certain margin, and the margin wasn't there. And uh, Mike Shinakis uh, knew Nick the Greek in New York. He made the contact with Mike. Mike drew a Melchorian man into it, and Bud Grover and uh, a couple of others became involved. Big Elmer Benke, the key center, for, didn't even know what the hell was going on. But they, those guys were so good. They could control a game and win by just what it took to stay within a margin. But what they got out of it was paltry, a couple of hundred bucks a game, you know. It wasn't worth it. And I asked Bill Mann one time after the scandal broke, I said, Billy, what, what was your greatest disappointment? Because it just destroyed their credibility totally. And the people in Prairie were adamant because they, were, they loved these guys. And he said, We'll never know how good that team could have been. Mm -hmm. You know, they could have mm -hmm. blown them away, but they didn't. Uh, but anyway, uh, that turned the tables on the store because people wouldn't come down. You know, we're sitting there sucking wind, and with a lot of debt hanging overhead, we finally had to close it up. And it was that point where I then had to do something, and that's when I went to apply for the job at Keystone. Well, in the meantime, there was a fellow I played basketball with in Dutch League, a vice president with uh, Heister, wanted me to go into their export division in sales, and I kept holding Campbell off because I thought, my gosh, it's three months out of the country and three months back in. Oh, you got a blinky blink. We're about, uh, it's, it's going to end in about five minutes. Well, it just we'll say how long it. you were there. But I'd like you to. You forgot uh, Iron Walkers. Um, okay. Well, uh, and one way I want to go from this is, is when you finish that, is, is back up and talk about your artistic talents when you kind of found out you had artistic talent. What you did <laughs> oh, that was it. way back. <laughs> but we have to go back up. Back oh, up. wow. We'll, we'll, we'll finish. Well, I'll finish. just give you the, the job thing in rotation. Going on a while, yeah. Camille. Because, is it still uh, be, are we still getting five, five minutes? Five minutes. Between my junior and senior year, I worked at Hiram Walker yeah, unloading grading cars in a, in a distillery on the cleanup game. And I won't give you a lot of detail on that. That's but, just, he uh, forgot just, it. Just enough of that. Yeah. And uh, what's maybe of interest, uh, oh, one of a, them. it's not a, hardly a recommendation, but Keystone is still hanging on by a thread after I spent 30 years with them. I've been, next March will be, uh, I'll be retired 20 years. Uh, they're just, ha just hanging in there. But every company I have worked for from day one ain't around no more. The farm is different. Bofies is gone. Christ Market is gone. Black and Cool is gone. Hiram Walker. Walker is gone. Mears and Label is gone. Uh, something. Oh well, the holiday store is gone. That restaurant you worked at for a little oh, while. Oh yeah, I did the a part-time manager for the Mecca restaurant out in Park. On He's a jack of all trades. And, <laughs> and, and that's gone. Uh, I'm it, still here. <laughs> you're still hanging in there, baby. But. Uh, uh, Anyone would hire me as a fool because they were destined to fail. Well, you retired at 53 years old. I think that's a young man. He's still a young man. Uh, well, let's let's continue on that path with with Keystone. Just give me a capsulization of Keystone. Well, I started with him on March 3rd of 1952, and as a sales trainee, I, uh, I was given a responsibility of an assistant to a. Uh, the director of uh, government and export uh, business, and uh, Jesse Schmid, wonderful guy. And uh, I learned a lot through that because we dealt with things that had a lot of detail and high specifications involved. 
And of course, the first six months was a training program where I toured certain areas of the mill and I'd be quizzed on it. And uh, they'd give me a six month review. And if I passed the six month review, I'm good for another six months. Well, at the end of a year, if you made it through the first two periods, you got a job. That's really what it amounted to. And they hired me at the big number of $275 a month. Big time. With a wife and two kids. Well, at that time, a wife and one kid. Vicky was born in, in Root, and so was Craig during the time of Keystone. Because it started in 52, see. And Vicky didn't uh, come around until, what? 53. 53. Well, Camille's Craig, 50, and Vicky was 52, yeah, and Craig's 55. Craig, 55. And I was 25. But anyway, after uh, four years in a position of, uh, as an assistant to a sales director in different regions of the company's business, I was then given a territory assignment. Uh, they opened up the industrial division in the south, and I took over as a missionary to develop new business in Kentucky, Tennessee. And after the first three months, I got a nice letter how well I'm doing and added on Alabama and Georgia. So I had the whole South, you might say, and had that from uh, 1956 until 62. And then in, uh, in 59, we built uh, the home on the lake and loved it there. And when they called me in the March of 62, about coming back in in July of 62, I just about. Who we're at. Okay. So we got up to 59, we'll say. Yeah. We'll okay. pick it up from there. 